Hi, I'm Zachary, ready to inform the world with Zaniness and Intrigue. Sort of, of like a few weeks ago, I saw the new Beauty and the Beast, and if you've seen the old one, good for you, and if you've seen the new one, meh, still good for you. I know many people know the story, but I might as well say it anyway. It's basically the story of a prince who becomes a beast because he was cursed by pissing off a fairy, so yeah, that happened. In order to break the curse, he has to find someone who will love him despite his beastly features, and he eventually meets a woman named Belle who will go on a journey with him for a tale as old as time and a song as old as rhyme, and if you've seen the movie, yeah, again, you probably know the rest. I will say my good, my bad, and my final thoughts or any kind of thoughts at all, so. Yeah, here I go right now. You know, honestly, it's basically the same movie, you know. A woman falls in love with Beast and he has a change in heart and they had like singing candles and items and Gaston and yada yada yada. But still, there are some changes here and there and that I'm glad that, you know, there's or some originality to this version. Okay, I'm gonna be honest about this. Dan Stevens is hot as the Beast. And no, I am not encouraging bestiality, but then again, they did have this in the movie, and plus, societal definitions of beauty are BS anyway. In all honesty, the Beast in the 90s was really buff, and it looks like, yeah, can you really bone with that dude? In this version, it looks like even if Belle didn't break the spell, and he still ha like the Beast still has a mind in that brain of his, yeah, you know, I could say they can still bone, so, yeah, I'll buy it. Plus, this worked in Gargoyles, so, yeah. That's my good evidence right there. That or the one in the 80s with Linda Hamilton and Ron Perlman. This movie also expands on the Beast's past and it also shows why he became the way he is, but more on that later. Also, there's his other love interest, Belle, played by Emma Watson. And man, this is basically like the first movie I've seen post Harry Potter. And no, I have not seen Perks of a Wallflower. She's born to play Belle, she can act, she can sing, and she still has that whole Hermione Granger charm. Fun fact, she took singing lessons for this role, and, well, they paid off, but more on that later. Just like the 90s movie, the castle staff are just plain amazing, and they're played by very well-known actors like Ian McKellen, Emma Thompson, and Ewan McGregor, and He's a fun Lumiere. Also, Gugu Magatha Rock is in this movie, and besides playing Marcus Jones' sister, I'm actually enjoying her role because, well, she's also the love interest for Lumiere, you know, the feather duster, and they got some chemistry. And yeah, they're objects, so I guess they can have some chemistry even if they're objects. Also, Audrey McDonald is in this movie, and if you remember her, she was Naomi from Private Practice, and man, the woman can sing, and she's like the hairdresser, well actually, She's the dresser in the movie, and she also has a love interest too, which was not in the 90s movie, and he's a piano. Sadly, it's not Forte from The Enchanted Christmas, but then again, we need just one villain, so yeah, I'll deal with that. Emma Thompson is a very good Mrs. Foss because she has that whole motherly affection, and she does have some songs here and there, and yes, they do add more music and new music too for this version of the movie. Also, the one thing I like is that Cogsworth is, well, he's basically still snooty and a suck up and a bit of a coward still, but he does care for the staff. But however, when you put Ian McKellen in this, he's just basically cranky throughout the whole role. And I'm just glad to see more Ian McKellen. Also, more characters I have to talk about are LeFou and Gaston. And LeFou is played by Josh Gad, and Gaston is played by Luke Evans. They are fun to watch in this movie and they are born to play this, plus they do have the singing experience and it's so amazing to see them together. However, there are some different things compared to this version to the 90s version. First off, Gaston in this version is not really beefy and he still acts like an alpha dog, but still they have some characters to change and he's a little more in the movie than he was in the 90s version. I'm glad Josh Gad is in this movie because after Pixels, which was basically a bad career move, I'm glad he's doing more good stuff in this role. That or he probably has a contact with Disney, I don't know. In all honesty, he's also like my favorite character in this movie because let's just say he gave him a more dignified look and whole attitude and he's probably a little snippy here and there. Like when Gaston's girls, like his fandom, like say they think he's hot, LaFou says, yeah, not gonna happen ladies. And I'm like, <laughs> man, LaFou has some like whip right there, so yeah. Also, what's different about this version of LaFou than to the old versions of LeFou is that, well, he's a little more three-dimensional. Like, well, let's see. He's basically Gaston Sucka, but not too much of it, and it's subtle. But however, he starts to become more complex and also questions Gaston's motives, and he's like wondering if Gaston is the right, you know, friend for him. So, 
Huh. Good for him. Also, I'm gonna talk about this that like people are saying, like, yeah, LeFou is officially gay, but it's kind of glossed over, so even if you, like, watch this movie all the way, it's just only a few seconds where it hints from maybe he's gay, but yeah, it's just glossed over, but still, progress in movies for Disney, I guess. Lastly, there's Maurice, and I'm a little conflicted because Maurice in the old version was more of a crackpot inventor, and he's, like, very eccentric, but in this version, He's, very, he's still the inventor, but he's also very artsy. And, you know, I love Kevin Klein. I think he did a good, like, role for it, but, yeah, I'm still conflicted. I don't know, but still, he did a good job. Besides the characters being great, the castle and, like, the settings is great, too. I mean, the village, but mostly the castle. It's basically its own little world, and throughout the movie, it is like that because of the fairy's curse. You see, in the movie, not only does she curse the beast and the staff, she also plays a spell to forget the beast and all the people who remember him, yeah, they don't know he exists, so yeah, that's kind of brilliant right there. Plus, it also morphs with the beast's attitude, like when he gets hurt, the castle is damaged, and then when he's angry, the castle kind of shakes and all that, and I'm actually glad for these kind of changes, so it shows like there's a connection between him and the staff and the castle. Also, speaking of the staff, the further the petals drop on the rose, and yeah, they still have the rose in the movie, it, yeah, the objects kinda t slowly turn mechanical or become objects themselves, and it's sort of a slow process, but man, they really emphasize on that. Like when, you know, like Lumiere starting to feel the effects of the curse, he's starting to become more metallic and moving like, and yeah, I'm kind of glad they put that in the movie. Another thing I want to point out in the movie is that the whole fairy cursing the staff, yeah, it's a little more understandable now, or a little justified in her view, and you see, when the beast became, you know, like, evil before being turned into the beast, yeah, the staff basically did nothing. I mean, they watched and felt bad, but they didn't do nothing, and it shows, like, the fairy punished them because of not doing anything to stop the beast from becoming a prat or... Just a jerk, and yeah, I could stand by that. Another thing I also like is that they do respect the original, original, original story. And I'm not talking about the Disney one from the movie, I mean the old story, like that existed before Beauty and the Beast, the Disney version. In that original story, the father of the beauty wants to give his daughter a rose, so he decides to pick the rose from the beast's garden, and he didn't know there was a bee. So the beast caught him, and he decides to give him, like, you know, a punishment of sorts. And, yeah, I respect putting some, like, little nudge to the old into the new movie. While this movie does put some new stuff into it, it also adds some new songs here and there. Even new ones from Celine Dion, and more songs for the characters. So, yeah, I like some new music in this movie. While I did enjoy this movie, I have certain gripes I just want to talk about. And it's just basically some gripes, and not a big thing to hurt the movie. So, yeah. Let me just say my piece. Some things are not focused on more, like Belle's past and the Beast's past, and they do add that Belle's mom died of the plague, and it sounded like an interesting thing, and even saw it in a book, which is basically some kind of magical book to, like, time travel or whatever, but, yeah, it sort of goes nowhere or plays something, but it's just kind of glossed over, and I wish they had more expansion on that. Even the Beast's past, they just show, yeah, his mom died, and he became a jerk because of his dad's influence, and I wish they expanded more, like, realized the consequences of a parent's actions, and I just wish they focused on that more. The music is also great in this movie, but there's some things that bug me about certain singing, like, voices, and it has to be with Emma Watson, and I'm sorry. It's just, when I hear her, she's very good. Believe me, she is. However, her voice is not very grand, like, like Paige O'Hara's, and yeah, she did practice, but... She's not that much of a pro, and uh, I feel like she needed more vocal power. And I felt like there were some strong parts here, but some of it kind of falls flat. But then again, maybe that's just my nostalgia. Also, I'm not dissing Emma Watson. I love this girl, and I'm a fan. But the singing is, it's good, but it needs to be great. And with more practice, I do think she will be great, and I have hope right here. Another thing I want to point out is that I do love the Broadway version of Beauty and the Beast, and they do add some songs to that musical, but man, I wish they had some songs from there, and it was more like a missed opportunity. If you listen to Human again in the Broadway version, it's just a beautiful song with the servants where they wish to be human again, or they're basically preparing the whole dance thing, you know, and they have their song. And it was a missed opportunity again, and 
well, who knows, maybe it'll be deleted soon, but still, you gotta make some cuts here and there. Still, they did, did add this song in the DVD or future Blu-ray releases, and I don't get why they could just add this, but then again, there I go. Speaking of music, uh, I'm not too big on the whole Ariana Grande and John Legend version because, well, I just grew with the whole Celine Dion and Piala Bryson one. It was just more mystical to me, and... I love my 90s all crystal sounding, and if you listen to Beauty and the Beast by those two, God, I love the 90s style of it. Ariana and John are good, it's just, I don't know, I'm just heard so many versions, I'm just, it's not my favorite. And yeah, I heard different versions by Jump 5 and Jordan Sparks, but yeah, I like the two latter better than this one. Just because I have some gripes with this movie, it doesn't mean I hate it, I love it. It's beautiful, it's visual, they do new things to it, and they put their own twist into it. And I love it. It's romantic, visually pleasing, and if you're a Disney fan like me, yeah, you'll love it. And that's all I have to say about Beauty and the Beast 2017. I'm Zachary, ready to inform the world with Zayness and intrigue.